The Triassic Jurassic border was marked by the fourth major mass extinction event in life's history. The Triassic mass extinction would wipe out about 50% of all species on the planet Earth and was likely triggered by volcanic activity. During the Jurassic, we're going to see life have to contend with recovering from what happened during the Jurassic mass extinction, but also deal with a rapidly changing Earth. Because during the Jurassic, Pangaea is going to start to break apart in earnest. And as a result, the species that existed during the Jurassic had to, cha had to deal with an Earth that was quite literally changing right underneath their feet. In this video, we'll talk about the Jurassic, which is truly the beginning of the age of dinosaurs, where large-bodied reptilian carnivores and herbivores dominated the planet Earth. While reptilian predators in the ocean, such as ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, dominated ocean life and pterosaurs roamed the skies. So stay tuned while we learn about the Jurassic. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. The Jurassic would follow the fourth major mass extinction event in life's history at the end of the Triassic. Uh, it's a very interesting period marked by uh, lots of continental change as the Earth is rapidly changing and Pangaea is falling apart, as well as great turnover in terms of species dominance on land. The Jurassic is a period that lasts roughly 56 million years, beginning about 201 million years ago and lasts until about 100 and 45 million years ago. Uh, now, what would happen on the planet Earth uh, geologically is very interesting. Uh, the Triassic mass extinction was probably the result of geologic activity that was beginning to result in the collapse of Pangaea. So Pangaea, which had existed for a supercontinent for a very long time, from the end of the Carboniferous up to the uh, middle of the Jurassic, uh, was beginning to fall apart at this point. And what would start to happen by the mid Jurassic is we're actually going to see the first major continental movement where we're going to separate into two major uh, supercontinents, a northern one known as Laurasia and a southern one known as Gondwana. And the movement of the tectonic plates that was leading to this change in the appearance of uh, or the, the dissolution of Pangaea and the existence of these two supercontinents was happening as sort of a backdrop to what life was experiencing during this particular time. Now, the Triassic mass extinction event uh, what resulted in the death of most of the large-bodied amphibians and the reptiles uh, in terrestrial environments. And as a result, we're going to see some turnover. So, for example, when we look at what happened with, with the large-bodied herbivores, uh, the, the, the rhynchosaurs uh, and, and the etosaurs are going to start to go away. And instead, they're going to be replaced with the sauropods. So the sauropods actually uh, were a fairly minor group of, of reptiles that first appeared during the late Triassic. The earliest ancestors uh, that made it into, that survived into the Jurassic were, were small bipedal herbivores. But by the time we get to the early to mid Jurassic, they're actually, their descendants of those early sauropods were actually going to develop a, bi, a quadrupedal uh, gait, walking on all four legs again. And they would evolve to be the single largest land animals to ever appear on planet Earth. The sauropods are these big, long-necked, herbivorous dinosaurs that weighed several tons um, and were so large that they really couldn't be hunted by pretty much even the largest apex predators at that time. So the sauropods would be the large-bodied herbivores that would dominate the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods moving forward. Another group of dinosauromorph archosaurs that would uh, would diversify and appear in great abundance during the Jurassic and then into the Cretaceous were the theropods. So advanced theropods actually show up in the late Cretaceous and they're characterized by having hollow bones, uh, three digit limbs. Um, and in, during the early stages of the Jurassic and in, in the late later part of the Triassic, uh, these, these early theropods were entirely carnivorous. During the Jurassic though, they would actually diversify and they would uh, be both carnivorous, they would be herbivorous, they would be omnivores, they would also be pisca piscivores, so predominantly eating fish. Um, so the theropods uh, would actually be a very dominant group and they would give rise to um, you know, great hunters like Allosaurus would eventually give, uh, would eventually at the end of the Cretaceous, they're the same group to which Tyrannosaurus Rex actually belongs. Um, but they played a prominent role in almost every terrestrial niche on the planet Earth. What's really interesting about the theropods is actually it's the descendants of this group that would be the only 
dinosaur and reptiles to survive the Cretaceous mass extinction, spoiler alert, and give rise to all modern birds during the latter part of the Jurassic and the early part of the Cretaceous. Now, during the Jurassic period, what we would start to see is another group known as the Ornithischians begin to actually appear as well. So the third major group of reptiles that were around during the Jurassic. Now, the Ornithischians, the name Ornith actually means bird-like, but what they're referring to is the fact that the Ornithischians actually had a bird-like hip joint that made them look very much like modern-day birds. However, the Ornithischians were not the ancestors of modern birds. That instead came from the theropods. And what we start to see by the mid-Jurassic is the appearance of flying theropods. Um, we start to see species, for example, like Archaeopteryx, uh, which look very much like a hybrid between a modern day bird and a Jurassic reptile. They had the feathers, they had the warm blooded metabolism that we would expect from birds that modern birds have. They would have powered flight in the form of feathered wings, but instead they would also retain many reptilian characteristics that modern birds don't. For example, they would have teeth, uh, which modern birds don't, and they would also have claws. They would retain those reptilian qualities as well. Over time, as we get through the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous, we start to see many of these reptilian traits away, and the avialans would give rise to the first true birds during that time period. These would be the only archosaurian, they're the only dinosaurian reptiles to actually survive into the modern era through the Cretaceous mass extinction, and it truly means that modern day birds are the last remaining dinosaurs, interestingly enough. Now, these flying, these flying reptiles were not the only flying reptiles during this time. The pterosaurs, which had evolved during the Triassic, were dominant in most aerial niches. Uh, they were these large-bodied, uh, large-bodied, predominantly carnivorous uh, uh, flying reptiles that had skin wings. Now, to be clear, pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. Pterosaurs are not the descent or the ancestors of modern-day birds. They developed flight in a completely separate lineage. But we see during the Triassic and then in the Jurassic, two separate groups of reptiles actually gain power flight. Now, these pterosaurs would actually go extinct by before the end of the Cretaceous. Um, so they would be gone. It would just be the birds that were remaining uh, during, that uh, during the uh, latter part of the Cretaceous and into the modern era as we uh, reach in terms of species that retained power flight. Of course, we also still have arthropods. Uh, that, were, that, were, that were the first to develop flight, and they're still flying around as well. The Jurassic uh, flora was largely dominated by the species that survived the Triassic, mass ex the Triassic mass extinction event. So if we looked at the Jurassic forest, we'd see lots of different conifers. We'd see seed ferns. We'd see ginkgos, ginkgos of which only a single species uh, still exists in modern day times. We'd also see uh, two major groups, the cichids and the benetitales, uh, actually reach their peak diversity during the Jurassic as well. Seed ferns would be, would be one of the dominant species, particularly in the northern supercontinent of Laurasia, although they would be uh, a minority species in the southern continent of Gondwana after that split begins to happen during the mid-Jurassic. The other thing to know, and I still want to stress this, grasses are angiosperms, and we tend to think of grasses as being this dominant species on the planet Earth. At this point, there still aren't grasses. They haven't actually evolved yet. And if you're looking at what the ground cover likely looked like in a, in a Jurassic forest, it was going to be in the form of ferns. So small ferns that have been around for hundreds of millions of years at this point are now providing the majority of ground cover in the Jurassic forests. Now, if we go back to see what we're going to notice is there is going to be uh, large bodied reptiles that are the dominant species. Now, of course, we still have fish species, both cartilaginous and bony are major components of ocean biomes. But if we're looking at what the large predatory species are at this point, it's still going to be the ichthyosaurs. So think reptilian dolphins and the plesiosaurs. So if you think about what the Loch Ness monster is supposed to look like, it looks a lot like a plesiosaur. So this is what we're dealing with when we look at the ocean biomes. During the Jurassic, we would also see coral reefs begin to reform. Uh, we would see the most of the aquatic and marine species begin to reestablish uh, their diversity after being heavily hit during the end Triassic mass extinction. Now, there are lots of other species, of course, on the planet Earth at this point. They don't play quite the large role that reptiles do during the Jurassic. Uh, if we look at the amphibians, the Temnospondyli, which were the dominant amphibian group that survived during the Triassic. Most of those went extinct at the end of the Triassic period, um, and, and those that remained were uh, a very minor component of the ecosystems. List amphibia, so the frogs, uh, they start in salamanders. They actually begin to diversify and recover some of their diversity uh, during the Jurassic as well. One of the things we'd actually see with the list amphibia, which survived during into the Jurassic, is they developed their first 
hopping form of locomotion. We slowly start to see that body plan and that form of locomotion begin to develop. So frogs start to hop in the Jurassic. If we look at the mammals, the first true mammals begin to appear during the Jurassic. And uh, we actually, uh, at the end of the Triassic and into the, into the early Jurassic, by the time we get to the end of the Jurassic, we're going to see the first relatives of monotremes, so platypuses and echidnas. Uh, and the first relatives are mar of marsupials and placental mammals actually begin to appear in the fossil record. Although we wouldn't find the first true members of those groups until we get to the Cretaceous period, but their ancestors begin to appear uh, towards the end of the Jurassic. Now, the cool part about the Jurassic is it's not going to end in a mass extinction event. Yes, there were some events. Uh, there was some turnover in ecological niches. What's interesting is at one point in time, the, the end of the Jurassic was classified as a mass extinction event. But the more evidence we have from the fossil record, the more it suggests that it wasn't necessarily a mass extinction event. But instead, what we were looking at is uh, in terms of at least the fauna in terrestrial biomes, we start to see certain groups being replaced by other groups. So uh, some groups go into the descendancy and other groups take over their spot as an ascendancy. So it's not going to be like everything's wiped out and then recovers. It's just sort of a replacement. So what we start to see at the end of Jurassic is certain groups that were very prominent throughout the period uh, are going to be less dominant. We're going to see groups that were uh, less dominant during the most majority of the Jurassic become the dominant species as we head into the Cretaceous. Again, when we get into the Cretaceous, we're going to see a world that is still dominated by reptiles. We're going to see the dinosaur morph uh, archosaurs dominate terrestrial biomes. The remaining the remaining reptiles, the crocodilians, for example, which were the dot with some of the dominant species towards the end of the Triassic, they spent the entire Jurassic being relegated essentially to aquatic biomes. They're now the minority of species, and they would stay that way well through the Cretaceous. And in fact, we would really never see the crocodilomorph, uh, dino, uh, crocodilomorph reptiles really become dominant again in the history of life on Earth. The dinosaurs are going to continue to, do to dominate as we head into the Cretaceous. And instead, what we're going to see is certain species turn over and be replaced by other ones belonging to the same group. So, for example, certain theropods would go away. We see the allosaurs as one of the dominant carnivorous theropods during the Jurassic. They would go away towards the end of the Jurassic. And instead, by the end of the Cretaceous, we have one of the greatest terrestrial predators of all time, Tyrannosaurus rex, dominating terrestrial biomes. We'll talk about the Cretaceous period in my next video, and I hope you'll stay tuned. Unlike many of the geologic periods we've spoken about, the Jurassic would not end with a mass extinction event. Instead, we would have a transition as we went from, a, from the Jurassic period into the next period known as the Cretaceous. In the Cretaceous period, we're still going to see a world dominated by reptiles. We're going to see uh, dinosaurs roaming the earth. We'll have pterosaurs in the sky and we'll have ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and a new friend known as the mosasaur begin to show up in the oceans. So I hope you'll stay tuned for my next video where we talk about the Cretaceous. Hope you learned a lot. Thanks for tuning in and I hope to see you next time. Bye.